today is, as was said earlier, the International Day of Prayer for the First Community Church. And as you saw, this is an example of the First Community Church. And it's not just Pakistan. It's all around the world. These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's take a look. Father God, we're so blessed here. You've blessed us with the ability to meet together in freedom without concern that someone's going to come and kick down our doors or burn our church down around us. Lord. We don't have to worry, Lord, about not having good jobs or not having a place to live, Lord, or having our families kick us out here, at least. That's not the way it is in a lot of parts of the world, Lord. So, Lord, we day, today we, we pray, Lord, for the persecuted church. Your people, your children around the world who don't live in the kind of comfort that we do. Lord, who's, in some ways, when they take their faith, they have to take it a lot more seriously. But that shouldn't be so, Lord. Help us to take our faith and our commitment to you just as seriously. Lord, help us to, to see our brothers and sisters as truly brothers and sisters. And just as we love our family members, to love them as well. And we just pray for them, God. We commit to pray for them. That they'll be happy, that they'll be growing, that they'll be safe. And that they'll thrive in the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. The other day I was at my my daughter's house and I had to take her someplace and while I was waiting for her to come out, my grandkids were there. And oh, you know, they were all over my grandkids. And the thing they were saying was, don't go, Grandpa. Don't go. I had to go. I had to take my daughter someplace. But don't go, Grandpa. Don't go. And it kind of reminds me a little bit about one of the joys of being a parent. And I have five kids, and when, they're big now. But when they were small, one of the things that I remember very much, and it's a good memory is them trying to keep me in one spot. And failing miserably, but trying to keep me in one spot. And, and there's techniques that small children do to keep their parents or their older siblings or their aunts or uncles or grandparents in a place, right? You've probably done it yourself. The, the first technique that I, I call, you know, I kind of named some of them, the first technique is called the toy burial technique. You know, you're sitting in a chair and they don't want you to leave and so they start bringing everything to you. And they put all these toys on your lap and, and various things and pillows and maybe they'll, they'll jump on top of it as well. And they try to keep you there in the chair. Of course, you're bigger than they are and so pretty soon you can actually, you know, get yourself out, right? And that doesn't work. And so they go to plan two. The second technique, which is like, if you remember Lord of the Rings in Gandalf, you shall not pass. This is the technique. And they get in front of the door and it's like, no, you can't leave now. You know, and they try to prevent that. And that's not going to get them anywhere either because you can pick them up and move them. The third technique is probably, for me, the one I find the most fun. This is called the leg limpet technique. Okay? It's where the child gets and grabs you around the legs with, with their arms and their legs and they sit on your foot, right? You know this one, right? 
And so this child is like a limpet, this little sea creature that is on your leg. And, and you have to kind of move like this with this child across the room. And I have five kids, and sometimes, sometimes I have two kids doing this. You know, two right here, and maybe one jumping on your back. And so you're like Frankenstein trying to move across the room. But eventually, because you're a lot bigger, you can get your wool done. You can leave them behind. That's sad, but that's life. You, you have to accomplish things and do different things, etc. But it reminds me also of a memory verse today that we have. Job 42, 2. It says, I know that you can do all things, Job says. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. See, while my children couldn't thwart me leaving, circumstances could have. Various things in our lives can stop our will, can stop us from moving forward. But the thing is, it's not the same as God. Nothing we can do, nothing the world can throw at God, can stop God from doing what He wants to accomplish. God's will cannot be stopped by man. We may try. We may even try to do what we consider God's will for Him. But no one can thwart what God wants to do. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad about that? When you think about it, when you think of that, nothing, nothing can come against God and succeed. That means nothing that Satan throws at us, none of his traps, none of his ploys, nothing that happens, happens without God's permission. Now that doesn't mean that there's not bad things that happen to us. That doesn't mean that we don't experience loss. That doesn't mean that the people don't die. That doesn't mean that we don't get sick. But nothing in our lives happens without God's explicit permission. He will be able to stop anything that comes our way. We may not see the purpose of it. We may not see how in the world, God, this could be the right choice. But that's where we need to trust Him. That's where we need to have faith that He knows what He's doing. Because he sees the big picture. And even though we may suffer, even though we may be in a situation we just cannot see the line, we need to understand that God is in control. And not only that, not only that, the Bible talks about the fact that all good things come from God. All good things come from God. Can you imagine a world where God was not in control? Can you imagine a world where God was completely separate? That's the definition of God. Because God is out of the picture, there is no good. Can you imagine what life would have been like for those Christians that we just saw there? Did you notice something about them? I mean, this guy's getting down in the sewer, right? He's got it up his here. He's splashing. He's getting on his face. How horrible. But did you see the faces of the people as you're in the church? Did you see the faces of these people, the joy that was in their life? Despite their circumstances, despite all these things happening to them, did you see how God was working? See, that's the thing. It's not about circumstances. It's not about the bad things that are happening in our lives. It's about who is in our lives. In those circumstances. Too many times we forget that. Too many times we just focus on the bad things in life, the, the circumstances in life, without really focusing on the fact that we have someone on us, someone there for us, who's going to help us do these things.
we yesterday a bunch of us from the church were at the charge conference for uh, our denomination and they brought in a guest speaker by the name of Dr. David McDonald and he was he gave a couple of sermons the first one was called happiness the second one was called hope and there were a lot of things we could learn from that things to take away talk about you know sometimes you know things that affect your happiness might be your diet, your, your physical things, various other kinds of things. But one of the things that really stood out for me from this, that I took away from it, that both in happiness and in hope, a lot of it comes down to choice. How we choose to see life. How we choose to see God interact with it. You see, our hope and our happiness, our true hope and happiness come from God. But we choose to embrace that. We choose to be happy. We choose to not let the circumstances get our down. Instead, we turn our hope to God. We entrust our happiness to what He's doing in our lives. It's a choice. It's a choice that we choose to look beyond the bad and embrace the good. We see things happening in our lives that we don't understand. And then we have the choice to look at it and say, okay, what is God doing with this? What is God's plan? What is His purpose? Lord, I don't understand. I'm hurting. But I know you. I trust you. And I know you have a reason behind this. And I can be happy. I can have joy. Because I know he's in charge. I know he hasn't abandoned me. I know he's there for me. It's exciting when we can see what he does. When we actually look through the persecution, through the bad things, and see what God is doing, his hand at work. And sometimes we really need to pray and ask God, show me. So I'm not seeing it. But today's tale, we're going to see how God is working in a situation that looks impossible. And today's tale starts out with a despicable plot. A despicable plot. You remember what's happening. Paul has been uh, basically captured by the Jews. The Jews have decided, you know, because of his preaching and everything, he's there, they've seen him as a troublemaker, they want to kill him. There's a riot, they begin beating him. He's rescued by the, by the guards, uh, the Roman guards. They take him and they bring him before the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, another riot breaks out. <laughs> and once again, he's taken from that. And he's had a bad couple of days here. But Paul's enemies are determined. They're not going to give up. And so we look in Acts 23, 12 through 15 and see this. The next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and said, we've taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we've killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on a pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case, and we're ready to kill him before he gets here. Despicable plot, right? Got it all lined up. Paul's enemies meant business with this vow they were fully committed. We kill Paul or die. Right? And vows back then, they're taken pretty seriously. The sad irony of this is that these were not necessarily evil men. See, we often look, we look at this and we say, oh, these guys are evil. Not necessarily. They believed they were defending the faith. They believed that what they were doing was right. They believed they were following God. 
Well, how can this be? I mean, obviously, can't they see it as wrong? The thing is, is oftentimes, people can be fooled. We can be fooled. And thinking we're following God when we're actually not. Almost a thousand years ago, the Crusades happened in Europe. And there were a lot of reasons behind it. A lot of it, the, the core reasons were uh, power play. Who is going to control the Middle East? But for the common people, what they believed, what they were told, etc., was this, this, these Crusades... What you're doing is, is for God. And thousands and thousands of people over hundreds of years engaged in this with the belief that they were doing something for God. On both sides, both the, the Islamic side and the Christian side. And people were slaughtered. Men, women, children. All in the name of God. Most recently in our history, we think about 9-11. September 11th and, the, and the, the Twin Towers. Why did these guys do this? Was it because, oh wow, I'm going to get a lot of money if I crash, my, crash this plane into the towers? No. I'm going to get fame and glory? No. They believed they were doing it for God. They believed, yes, I'm going to be rewarded in heaven, but ultimately... The reason they're doing this and the reason we see suicide bombers and, you know, and people who, who strap things to, their, to their, their bodies and go into trains and buses and crowds and blow themselves up, oftentimes it's because they honestly believe they're doing it. Many of these people who persecute Christians in other countries believe that they're doing it for their God or their gods. We must be careful to follow God the way He wants us to follow Him. But how do you do that? How do you know? It's through a close relationship with Him. I talk about, we talk about, you know, the importance of coming to prayer meetings. We talk about prayer. We talk about reading this Bible and knowing it. We talk about spending time with God. It's not just because He wants you to do something. Hey, it's something to fill your time, right? Instead of TV. Or this. It's not it. Because the only way you can know the truth is through a close relationship with God. And the only way you get that close relationship with God is by reading His Word. Fellowshipping with fellow believers, iron sharpening iron, praying, meditating on Scripture, and asking God to speak to you. That's the only way you learn to follow God and what He has for your life. But this story has more than a despicable plot, by the way. This story has a valuable in form. Now, there's a lot of a lot of plotters, and they are 40 people, right? And they're coming to the Sanhedrin, but the Romans don't know anything about it because they're trying to keep it secret. You know, you don't come up with a plot and then tell everybody, right? You know, you, you try to keep it a secret. And so they're trying to keep it a secret, but word gets out among the Jews. And God had the right person here. Look in Acts 23, 16 through 22. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, we don't know if he heard it directly. We don't know if he heard somebody heard it and told him. I don't know. He went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you. Because he has something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside, and asked, What is it you want to tell me? 
He said, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give it to, in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They've taken an oath not to eat or drink until they've killed him. They're ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man with this warning. Don't tell anyone that you've reported this to me. A valuable informant. What were the odds? What were the odds of Paul's nephew being there just the right place, right time to hear this? Is it coincidence? I don't believe in coincidences. You see, the longer I'm a Christian, the more I see that our term coincidence is kind of a misnomer. There really are no coincidences. Because God's in charge. You know, one of the stories you, you, you've probably heard before, there's various, uh, because it's happened several times, but of soldiers, like uh, soldiers in World War II, they would take their Bibles with them. And oftentimes they would have them in their vest pockets or something like that. And they get shot and you know, their lives are saved because the bullet hits the Bible and doesn't kill them. There was one story I read about a veteran from World War II. Germans shot him, sure enough, hit into the Bible, did not go all the way through. But it's interesting, the bullet stopped at Psalms 91. And in Psalm 91, in verse 11, it says this, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Ooh! I don't know, I'm getting chills. Oh, it's just coincidence, right? A God incidence. A God incidence. God is in control. The nephew does the right thing. He does the right thing. But think how risky that was for him. Think how risky that was for him. I mean, these people are ready to tear Paul limb to limb. Limb from limb. This is, this is his nephew. If they find out he's, he's going along with this, they're going to do the same thing to him. Right? Doing the right thing is not always easy. You remember the story of Queen Esther in the Bible, right? A Queen Esther in the Bible, she's in a similar situation. There's a despicable plot going on to kill the Jews. And Queen Esther is in this position where she can talk to the king and maybe figure out a way to stop it. But she's in, she's in, a, in a hard place because at that time period, Kings were kind of capricious. And it was in the law that unless the king accepted you, let's say you appear at this door over here, I'm the king, you come in, and unless I point my scepter to you to allow you to come in, then you will be killed. That was the law. I have to be feeling really nice. I want to talk to her because if not, she's going to be killed. So for Queen Esther to come in to that chamber was risking her life, putting it all on the line. He hadn't called for her. She had to hope and trust that this was the right move. As Christians, we may also be called upon to risk it all in following God. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to be used by God and to risk it all if God should ask you to? Several years ago, a man by the name of Andrew Van Der Beek, a Dutchman, you may know him better as Brother Andrew. Brother Andrew was smuggling Bibles into communist Romania. One of the most famous incidences of this is he's got his small car packed with illegal Bibles for the Christians in there. He comes up to the border and he's, he's hoping there'll be one of those days they just pass through, you know, everybody. But instead, when he gets up there, the cars in front, several cars in front of him, 
The guards are being really diligent that day. And they stop this car and they go all the way through. And then the next car, same thing, they're pulling out, pulling out everything, you know, having the guy get taking the seats out of the car, taking the hubcaps off, everything, looking for illegal contraband coming into the country. And Andrew is concerned, obviously. He's got all of these Bibles. What's going to happen? And he prays about it. And he feels led to pray for a miracle. What if I just take some of these Bibles and put them on the front seat? Just make them visible. Why not? So he prays. The car in front of him, they take an hour to look through the car in front of him, tearing it apart. He moves forward in line. The guards come up. He's ready to get out the door. The guard's knee is blocking the door. He can't get out. The guard looks inside and goes, move on. <laughs> 30 seconds tops. He moves forward and, and he's got his, his foot kind of released from the pedal, just coasting like, well, should I pull over? Do they want to search it over here? Let's go. And, and the guard goes to the next car. And he just drives through. God's in charge. God's in charge. But we may be called to do risky things. We may be called to do something totally out of the box thinking for God. But the only way you will know if that is the right move is if you have a close relationship with Him. If you are really following God. If you are really seeking His face. Otherwise, you're just doing something. And who knows what could happen. This story has a despicable plot. It has a valuable informant. But it also has a conscientious commander. A conscientious commander. I, I love police dramas. Not a lot of them. Because they can get really, you know, uh, all the killing and stuff like that. But one of the things I like about police dramas, the good ones, is not when they show the cops as being stupid or in bad light or something like that, but when they show police commanders actually doing their jobs. Police that are actually following the law and are conscientious in the way they behave. And that's what I like about this. You see this guy who is he's not only clever, he's conscientious. And look at how he treats the nephew. He doesn't just blow him off or whatever. He, he grabs him by the hand. He brings him over. He pays attention. He listens to him carefully. He warns him. He says, don't tell anybody. Because he knows what's going to happen to him if he does. And then look what happens. Acts 23. 23-35. He says, then he called two of the centurions and ordered them. Get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at 9 to 9. This was a lot, by the way, for what they actually had on hand. Provide horses for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows. Claudius Lysias, to His Excellency Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and they were about to kill him, but I came with my troops and rescued him. For I learned that he's a Roman citizen. This is not exactly correct, by the way. This is just the way he spun it, you know. I wanted to know why they were accusing him, so I brought him to their Sanhedrin. I found that the accusation had to be with questions about the law, but there was no charge against him that deserved death or imprisonment. When I was informed of a plot to be carried out against the man, I, I sent him to you at once. I also ordered his accusers to present to you their case against him. So the soldiers carried out the orders, took Paul with them during the night, and brought him as far as Antipatris. This is about probably 35, 40 miles that they're mentioned as foot soldiers. Okay. The next day, they let the cavalry go on with him while they returned to the barracks. When the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. 
The governor read the letter and asked what province he was from, learning that he was from Cilicia. He said, I will hear your case when your accusers get here. Then he ordered that Paul be kept under guard in Herod's palace. Now, despite the fact that the that Lysias fluffed it up a little bit, I have to admire what he did. He knew he could have. He could have just waited. And he could have sent Paul with a you know a couple of guards and known that he's going to get killed. Hey, it's out of my hair. He could have refused to send it. And then that would have caused all kind of political nightmare for him. But instead, he's conscientious, he's clever. And he realized the best way that I can fulfill the law, that I can protect my prisoner, is to do this. He knew his job. And I think there's a lesson here. Even though this guy's not a Christian, I think there's a lesson for us here about how we should serve God. You know, if I look in this room and I would say, what your future is going to be? I say, you might be a nurse. You might be a teacher. Some of you are already that. You might end up in the food business. You might end up in industry someplace. You might be in the IT field. You might be in this and that and the other thing. But here's the thing. Unless you're doing something that is dishonorable, that is against God, I'm talking about becoming a thief, a drug dealer, or something like that. It doesn't matter what career your gifting from God has put you in. You can still honor God where you are. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a professional Christian teacher. You can honor God wherever God has placed you. The thing is, is are you willing to serve God wherever you are? Are you willing to serve God in the classroom? Are you willing to serve God as a nurse? Are you willing to serve God as an administrator? That doesn't mean that you're evangelizing all along the way. That may not be what you were called to do in that. But it means you are living as a living example for God. You are living in a way that brings honor to Him in your words, in your actions, in your thought. As I said, Lysias is not a believer, but he did what was right in the situation. He acted with honor. But was this level of protection he gives to Paul, once again, coincidence? No. Because there are no coincidences. And there's one person in this story we haven't told you about yet. A faithful Savior. A faithful Savior. See, the most important character in this tale was actually introduced in the verse before our focal passage. We talked about it last week. Let's look back at Acts 23.11. It says, The following night the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take Courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Paul could have a good night's sleep. No matter what's going on, no matter what's happening in Jerusalem, guess what? Paul knows he's going to Rome. Because God is told him. And you think to yourself, how does Paul, how does Paul get that? How does Paul get that direct connection with God? Once again, if you look at the life of Paul, Paul is a man who is constantly seeking after God. And God speaks to him. If you and I are constantly seeking after God, I firmly believe God will speak to us. That doesn't mean you will hear an audible voice. That doesn't mean a dove is going to fly down and start, Mark, you need to do this. I don't think so. It might. I'm not going to rule it out. God speaks to us a lot of different ways, but you will never hear this voice, ever, if you refuse to seek Him. If you refuse to try to follow Him. 
If you just expect him, he's going to talk to me one of these days, and you don't do anything? No, maybe. But the closer you get to him, the closer you deliberately seek to follow God, the more likely you are to hear him speak. Mm -hmm. It's your choice. Sure. Will you choose happiness, hope, Will you choose connection with God? Or will you just expect to make it happen? You see, we cannot be lukewarm Christians. We cannot be shallow people who just come and we sing and we raise our hands and we praise God and we leave and nothing changes. We have to be people who are different. This is a lifelong journey. You have to every day work at it. So I have to ask this question. How will your tail turn out? All of us have a tail. Paul has a tail, which is a very long one. We're going through. But how will your tail turn out? See, all of us have these tails, but guess what? We were never meant to direct our own tail. We were never meant to tell our own story. We were meant to be in the story with God and the with God calling the shots. With Him in charge. Listen to God's promise for those who live their lives with Him in charge in Romans 8.31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, who can be against us? Because every scheme of man, every plot is going to fail unless God decides that for whatever reason this has to pass. Because he's in charge. If that is our choice to follow, our choice to embrace what he has done for us through Jesus Christ. And we're coming to a time now in our service where we're going to celebrate communion. Where we talk about the fact that this is what God did for us through Jesus. Do I accept that? Do I accept what God has done for me? Do I remember the fact that Jesus, on the cross, his body was broken, his blood was shed for me? Because that's what that communion is all about. Remembrance of taking that bread and taking that symbolic blood and saying, I remember Jesus. I remember what you've done for me. And I don't want it to be nothing. I want my life to be different.